you imagine the scene in 1932, you have to think back to what had happened in 1929. The Great Depression had started catastrophic economic woes that got worse and worse and worse. So that by 1932, the majority of workers were not employed. People were poor. They had no idea where they were going to go, where they were going to look for a future. The city was so strapped for money, the banks were all closed, that it was printing its own script so that people could pay the bills. Things simply could not have been worse. Then it was William Volantiner, the then director of the museum, with the support of Edsel Ford, Henry Ford's son. Those two men undertook an extraordinary idea that at this time, when it looked like things could not be worse economically, they invited into this treasure house of the past the most famous communist probably in the world, Diego Rivera. And his commission was to paint something that would represent Detroit. No particular instructions, no kind of notion as to where it would be. Rivera said, give me all of these walls. This is what I want. Red velvet curtains were put up. Rivera's work unfolded gradually over a period of months from 1932 into 1933. So Edsel Ford would sit here and look and talk to Rivera, who thought of Edsel as a fellow artist. And the two of them, you could imagine, would sit here watching these great works unfold and wondering, what are these going to mean? What's going to happen? when people see them. There were a few people who got a preview. They were thought to be blasphemous. Pornographic. They were thought by some to contain hidden communist propaganda. It was some people's fear that when the populace, especially workers, got a look at these images, the city would erupt into violence. It didn't happen that way, did it? It did not happen. I think something <laughs> happened that's a lot closer to Rivera's intentions. Yeah, I see. That you look at these walls and yeah. you see who are the heroes in these images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The heroes are these working men. Uh, I understand. And those are the heroes that are going to get us into the future. Sure, sure, sure. And it takes quite a bit to get working men to riot. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> you have, I reckon you have some idea about what working and organizing might be like. Yes, indeed. Boy, I'm telling you something really something, when you look at it in detail. Uh, of course, uh, that's my section over there. That, that guy up there Engine on top. Engine manufacturer? The guy up there on top, yeah. making the iron. Yeah. That's where I spent my 40 years. 40 years in yeah. the foundry? Uh, in the, in the uh, blast furnace. Blast, wow. See, and that's, that's the steel they're pouring out of the blast furnace, <laughs> and, you know, put it, before it goes over to the steel mill. I worked in the steel mill part, mm -hmm. you know. And we were in that same old heat or something like uh, when you walk in there, they give you a shovel mm -hmm. and a wheelbarrow. That was your instruments of production. This is in the <laughs> 60s. And the, this is all the way to the 80s. And we still had shovels, wow. picks, and wheelbarrows. Basically the same thing those guys were doing in the 30s. Yeah, yeah. So it, it never changed much. <laughs> the technology wow. on the blast furnace. So if you had walked into the museum in 1933, when the murals first were revealed, you would have walked through the door behind me and you would have looked ahead and what you would have seen is what you see up there, images of gestation. What you can see is a human fetus and it looks like the fetus is somehow underground so that geological forces, natural forces are in a combination. And you see these images of plenty, these great female figures on each side, the earth's plenty the gestation of human life. So Rivera's always thinking, if the past is present, if you're trying to get these two things into sync with each other, he's always interested in these murals with locating the present, the 1933 present, uh, the scenes he's going to be painting on these walls, with these larger, greater forces, the forces of nature, the forces of geological production. Rivera has these huge allegorical figures representing what he thought of as the races of humanity. And then thrusting up from the earth are hands holding the wealth that's been produced by the earth. And behind me, you can see volcanic eruptions 
kind of violence that the earth undergoes in order to create the things that are going to be necessary to build the modern industrial world. Again, echoing Rivera's notion that creation and destruction are always linked together and put at the disposal of human choosing. It's like hanging a plasma TV screen on the wall of this Beaux-Arts Museum to say, you want to know what industrial production looks like? It looks exactly like this, live from the home of Ford Motor Company at Rouge River Plant. This is what it looks like. The only thing missing is that every time I see these, I always wonder what it would have sounded like. Uh, it's like watching a plasma screen with the sound turned off. As the world in which these images ar arrive from, that world must have been full of smells and sound. You know, on that tour, they, you've been to that tour of the room? Okay, well, you know, in, in, in one of those movie sections, they got the sound. Right. They got the sound loud enough to, to almost simulate what it used to be mm -hmm. like, but what you, can't, what you can't imagine is that you heard that all day long. Right. You know, you hear it for a second and it's gone. But man, you get eight <laughs> hours, you go home and lay down in the bed and the press still falling, flying, flying, <laughs> flying. <laughs> it never stopped, you know. Talking about the tour these days, yeah, and it's really amazing how, comparatively, how quiet the place is. Yeah. Big machines, yeah. people operating machines that are yeah. building the machines. Yeah. 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 Whereas here, yeah. it's all muscles. Muscle. And I think that's one of the beautiful things in this. These yeah. workers okay. are amazingly powerful. Yeah. You, know, you can tell, there's certainly machines yeah. in this world, but the yeah. workers are what's making the world work. That's true. These guys, true. Yeah. well, they're heroic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and they do, they do miraculous things. You do things you didn't think you could do. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine people never thought that humans could do this. Yeah, I know. Build the modern world yeah, that's true. as these guys right here have done. That's true. In the modern world, not just for Detroit, but the modern, the whole world. Yeah, that's true. that's true. You get in the shop, you know, everybody that comes in there, and probably these men did the same thing when they first went in. You know, they decided, well, I'm going to be here for a couple of years and mm -hmm. I'm going on and build my life. But, right. Uh, th this is not considered building your life, you know. Right. Just uh, a job. Just a job. So you get there and then uh, uh, two, two years later you got a wife and a child and the thing done changed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, what you thought was just a passing fancy done become a way of life and now you got to figure out if I'm going to be here then we got to change these things. Exactly. We got to make this thing a place that's livable that we can stand and that's kind of what hits you. What was, what was the beginning of drum? How did that start? Well, uh, pretty much off of Wildcat Strikes. Mm -hmm. Things that didn't have anything to do with discrimination per se, just so, but just the speed up of the line. You know, we were working 72 cars an hour, you know, at Dodge wow. Main at the time. And even that was speeding up, you know. So it led to a series of Wildcat Strikes. Just walked out, mm -hmm. you know, at lunchtime, wouldn't come back. It's a beautiful thing because it gets an opportunity to meet people that you never met before. You know, uh, you play Dodge Man, we had 10,000 employees in it. We had people on the other side of Joseph Koppel uh, that you never saw before. So now you meet some of them and you're talking. You've got common problems that you didn't mm -hmm. know you had before. Did it start with political ideas, or did it start like you're saying, it with we practical. just got to make this better for the men with, who are working here? It started with practical ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and politics, politics come later. Yeah. They come in the course of things. Uh, for instance, uh, obviously having a wildcat strike and losing production, they were going to discipline people. Right. They fired seven people. Uh, I was one, I, they fired another one, they fired uh, five whites. They brought all the five whites back and left me and the black guy out. So discrimination is, is not that that existed between those workers, right? Because we were united. Mm -hmm. But the company starts this mess, you right. know? And it forces us to have to fight that out that way. You take up every battle that you can find in that shop. Right. And you make a war out of it. <laughs> You know, and, and that's how it goes and grows. It yeah. comes yeah. out of a kind of spontaneous human action yeah. about the conditions of work, that's and right. out of that come the politics, and the politics right. then build the structure. Well, then the issues that you were confronting, uh, your opposition 
starts recognizing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the international union stopped having real tight control over the elections inside the plant, and then the blacks who were the majority began to get elected. Mm -hmm. You know, we started getting supervisors now. We got black supervisors here and there that we never had before. Right. They loosened up on the apprenticeship program, so now blacks can get a, a skilled trades job. And so things start moving. People start addressing the issues that you were promoting and putting forward. And therefore, the, the movement, as such as we know it, declines. You know, it doesn't have the ability to mobilize, at least on no, that footing, unless you can figure out how to change. But then once again, you know, if you become political again, it don't start that way. It starts spontaneously. Right. So, right. You know, and another upheaval. So. No, what's, when you were talking, I was thinking about Rosa Parks getting on a bus. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Once apparent, that's small right. action, and sure. out of that action, that's right. comes that's a right. whole generation that's of change. Right. That's right. And it sounds like the things uh -huh. you're talking about, uh -huh. while drum might not exist yeah. as a political movement anymore, the yeah. changes, changes that drum made stay. They stay. It's something because you know, I never thought, never thought I'd, I'd live to tell the stories. That's what that's what excites me about mm -hmm. it. You can't perceive to take uh, one or two steps forward without understanding where you've been. I, I live in Highland Park, right? So the first assembly line was right up the street, right? Well, the kids in the school that's next to the old plant don't even know that, right? They don't know that, you know. They got no, ain't nobody told them, and they, mm -hmm. it, it's just sitting there. Uh, I guess they're gonna try to do some reopening of a museum mm -hmm. up that way that the kids could at least then learn that this place was right here, that did, that brought so much to this world, you know, which which can't help but change their outlook on things because they're that close to it, you know. And I tell you, it's the rock we stand on. <laughs> And when you ain't on it, you ain't on a rock. <laughs> you don't saying that they get swept out from under you. Yeah. It's wisely said. And when you were talking, I was thinking of one of the famous statements of Henry Ford. Uh -huh. History is bunk, he said. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what he actually said okay. is a little more interesting. Yeah. And I think it's a lot smarter. Okay. He said, history is more or less bunk. Okay. It's tradition, and we don't want tradition. Yeah. We want to live in the present. I got and the you. only history that's worth a tinker's dam is the history we make today. I got you. Okay. Now, I think what happened <laughs> is that this machine got so good at producing wealth that I think people could believe that that was true. Yeah. You know, that I came from someplace else in the world, or okay. I came from the rural yeah. south, or yeah. I came here and I got yeah. rich, and I don't care yeah. about yeah. that stuff in the past. I don't care what came before. I've got this present where I've got access to a kind of mobility and wealth that I never dreamed a person right, like me would have. Right, right. So I think it's easy to think, <laughs> okay. oh, that rock of yours? Yeah. You know, I don't want to be standing on that rock. <laughs> I want to get out there to that house with a bigger yard and yeah, a couple of yeah, cars. Yeah, yeah, don't yeah, talk to yeah. me about rocks, yeah, you know? Okay. I, but I think when something goes wrong, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you think, wait, yeah. wait a second, yeah, where did how did I get here? here? What do I do where now? This come? Then all of a sudden, you feel like your feet are that's on right, sand. That's right. <laughs> And I think that's why Rivera literally okay. you know, is painting rocks into this mural. Yeah. That is okay. the yeah. natural world, yeah. the yeah. wealth of yeah. the mineral world, yeah. the substrate of yeah. the earth. Yeah. This all came from someplace. That's right. That's right. And he's keenly aware of that. Yeah. And I think once, however heroic and productive these great machines get, yeah. they're always in a context that's bigger than they are. You're rock. That's <laughs> right. That's right. I love that's that right. phrase. That's fantastic. <laughs> that rock is good. Yeah.